start off, anytime I see like direct sunlight, like what's over here, like a lower sun setting, directly kind of horizon level sun, I reach for the ring of fire. You not seen this? It's a one inch by one inch piece of aluminum pipe-ish. Actually, it's plastic pipe painted with aluminum paint. Even more budge. Somebody gave me this after I talked about prisming at a conference in like 2012. It was the AD guy that took my microphone off. He, as a joke, he's not a photographer, gave me like a pocket full of random stuff. This is the original ring that I've kept ever since. It's kind of worn out. So when you hold this up to your camera lens, like this, right in front. And if you're shooting with a really shallow depth of field, like 1.2, which this lens is, because I'm focused on a subject that's like further away, this being held in front of the lens, you can't tell that it's my fingers and a ring, right? It's totally out of focus and very blurry. The most you'll see is like some darkening. But when you shoot into the sun directly, you get a circular flare, the same shape as this ring. Because this ring has two ends, sometimes at the right angle, you'll actually get two different circular flares at the same time. It's crazy. And my favorite thing about teaching people this, if you go and get your like own one inch by one inch piece of piping, copper, whatever material you can find, the texture and effect of the flare is gonna be uniquely your own. Totally different, depending on how the edge of the pipe was cut and the exact size and shape and the color. It's really, really fun. So, in sunset light like this, it's a real easy way to start introducing flares. So let's wander over here. So again, we aren't gonna start with any of the AI stuff. I just wanna shoot things naturally the way that I normally would, and then we will feed the AI what the scene is and what it, you know, comes up with something more interesting. Hopefully not. Um, okay, let's get a little closer to the wall. Uh, you can keep facing me, a little bit closer to me. So I don't know what it looks like on the camera from this perspective, but one of the things I, I constantly try and balance is really, really bright backlight against something really nice. So she's actually the light on her face is very flattering and it's a totally different color temperature. Maybe this is a, a thing here in Prague. I don't see this a lot in the US, but she's actually like being bluely lit. Like this is a, a more white or blue light, which is uh, odd, but I guess it's because it's mostly coming from the sky over there. No matter what, with any technique, especially if it's the ring of fire prisming, if you're not starting from really good quality of light on your subject first, the photo has already failed. Like you cannot gimmick and affect your way into really compelling photos. Not long-term at least. Maybe you can try one thing new randomly and people will be like, wow, that's really creative and interesting. But if your light is consistently good on your subject as a starting point, the photo is already failed. Okay, Miles, win. Actually, I kind of like your hair. That's kind of cool. What's up? I kind of want another gust. One thing for me, I generally, in a situation like this, I'm gonna underexpose like crazy. I don't know if you can see that. Oh my God. Nice. Wow, that eye tracking is insane. Uh, other Nikon cameras I've used, like their earlier released uh, mirrorless stuff, very bad at exactly what you're seeing here with the eye tracking. But in general, in a really, really contrasty scene like this, where she's almost like a silhouette, because the sun is just so bright behind her, I expose the highlights. I'm gonna underexpose pretty extreme, like one eight thousandth of a second, and the lowest ISO I can get away with. The idea is to capture as much dynamic range as possible, so in post, I can edit a nicer, balanced scene. It's the exact same thing, ooh, I like that. You can say like that. It's the exact same thing a lot of photographers are trying to do when you use off-camera flash. They're trying to use flash to fill in and augment the sun or whatever brightest part of the scene is with um, the power of the flash. You can also do it with natural light. Here we go, okay. So, Chloe, that looks actually pretty, pretty perfect. Ooh, I like your eyes over that way. Yep. Beautiful sounds of rubber against crazy cobblestone. Perfect, perfect. Okay, give your hair like either a sweep, let me see. I would do the, the rock star flip. There it is, perfect. And then just kind of turn a little more and look that way. That's beautiful, perfect, hold that. Perfect. And then just, just your eyes right here. Yep, I'm gonna get real close. Ooh, ooh, I like that down look, that's cool. Beautiful, awesome. Okay, let's go somewhere else where I'm not blinding myself. The sunlight, this is why I have really, really bad vision. Because the past 10 years of my life has been shooting into the sun. Yeah, kind of like, okay, this door. Chloe, can you come closer actually? And I liked you facing that way, uh, like your whole body. And even more, even more, and then, oh, you can stay where you are, just turn. 
Turn, and I liked you looking way over your shoulder. Exactly like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. All right, it's the thing that caught my attention here is just the, um, the lines of the door. Compositionally, I'm gonna try and pay attention to, maybe this is a good one to feed the AI because I'm really curious about composition. The lines, I'm gonna try and position her face or at least her eyes, since that's generally where humans kind of look first in any photo, right in the sliver of uh, those diagonal lines. We'll see if it actually works. And then I'm gonna balance her key, just a small step in a little further. Yeah, but a little less, a little less. Perfect. Balance her like right between this column and that other arch thing. Something kind of like that. Yeah, perfect. Uh, and then a little more hair actually in front would be cool if you wanna bring it out. Yeah, perfect, perfect. And then just eyes right here, Cole. Yep. Nice. Ooh, nice. Perfect. Um, okay, I'm gonna take a picture of this. Oh no. Let's let's keep you in it to start. Boop. So uploading picture of the scene. And then let's give it a prompt. This is the part that's weird. I think even if this did work, the workflow aspect of it, like if I had an actual wedding client or somebody in front of me. That's totally weird to be on your phone for even two minutes to try and figure out. But a lot of uh, photographers have a you know downtime around dinner or meal time or something where you have you can play around. That's why that's actually the time of day where I get night photo ideas starting to churn because those are a little more complex because you have to add your own light a lot of times. You know that's as far as like preparation on any wedding that I do. That's the most amount I would ever do is sort of meal time. I can't talk and write at the same time. So creative composition of model. And then we stop there. I'm gonna use dash dash IW, which means image weight two, which means it's maximum weighted toward the source image as influence. And then dash dash AR, which means aspect ratio uh, four by three, which is roughly a landscape orientation. Let's see how it does. So this is interesting. Okay. It's roughly, so here's the source photo of her standing there just for my iPhone. It's fine, it's not perfect. I'm, it's, it's I'm recording this screen. Yeah. Uh, and then here's what it gave me. So it is uh, like heavily weighted toward the image. So like the, weirdly it's inversed here. Like it's a mm -hmm. flip, mirrored flipped image, but it's still approximately the same framing. The hell is she wearing? If you could go change real fast into our <laughs> folded paper skirt book thing, that'd be great. Um, and then also I'm gonna, if you could just chop off your legs, <laughs> that'd be great. <laughs> The yeah, the lips. I'm not seeing much here. I'm gonna I'm gonna do one change up and then let's find another spot to shoot. I'm gonna give the prompt something more random just to like see if it can give me something a little less obvious to what the actual scene is. I'm gonna say random perspective of model standing. 30%, it's looking pretty much the same. It is giving me a little nudge in more like the full body perspective, which I, personally I actually don't do a lot. Uh, I like to sort of hide the context of exactly where a subject is standing by like composing them from the waist up. That's exactly what I did with my previous photo, original photo of her. So, I mean, maybe that's enough of a, a nudge for me to just see this AI output and it's consistently saying go full body with it. Maybe it's a better photo full body. Maybe you should ask it to be more creative by giving it creative. I did, that was my original. Was it? Yeah, okay. so it's failing on us, but it's consistently saying go full body sideways and also, you look really glum in your pose. Like, just kind of, I don't know. Does that inform what you do as a person being photographed at all? Oh my God, the face. <laughs> and then make this exact, <laughs> if you can make, work on that look for me. Yeah, you got it, you nailed it. That's like straight up out of a movie, a very scary one. Yeah, you zoom in. All right, so let's go back. I'm gonna do one like full body, kind of right where you were. You can wear that if you want. And then maybe if you just want to rotate, just to get some variety. Good, 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 good. Cool. All right. So that was test number one. I'm not mind blown, like overwhelmed with how good the AI result was, but it set me off in an entirely new direction. But you never know until you actually have the files in front of you on a computer. It shocks me how often, especially on like the sad side of things. I think I shot a wedding or finished a session and I'm like, I didn't really do anything cool and creative, but I get it on my computer like a day or two later where I'm a little detached from the work. I'm like, oh my God, these are great. These are totally fine. I still know what I'm doing. Like even today, 
12 years after doing this, uh, I still have that feeling every time I shoot. So maybe those will be my favorite photos and I can thank the AI for the full body. Who knows? Uh, you're gonna be facing the light, so let me know if I have you look in a direction that's too weird. Right here? Yep, exactly. Cool. That's just fighting my own shadow. That's the only problem. But I think, ooh, but I like your shadow in it. Okay, can you kind of keep your body just like that, but turn and look way over this way? How how much can you look in that? Almost like over your shoulder. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, that's cool. Hold that. Beautiful. And then just eyes here. Yep. Good. Uh, get your hair just a little sweet. Um, it's actually more like on your shoulder. Yeah. Perfect. Yep. Got it. And nice. The cool thing about like harsh spotlight like this, she is way brighter than basically anything else in the scene that's not being hit by the light. So you can create really nice isolation that way by lowering the uh, just exposed for her skin tone and everything else is darker. So that just, yeah, creates nice subject isolation. It's perfect. Also, uh, catch light. That took me forever to figure out. The uh, catch light in somebody's... So I practiced a lot in my early days when I was doing portraits of um, like politicians and celebrities and stuff. To prepare for that, I would blow up a fake plastic mannequin and put it in a room, a conference room, and try and practice like quality of light stuff. If it, let's trend this way. Um, if it was like a soft box versus a strip box versus an umbrella, like I really had no clue about um, what the difference was. Uh, you could look at pictures all day long online and see like comparison stuff, but it, it, you really don't know until you see it happening in front of you what these uh, modifiers really do for you. Problem was my little mannequin doll had no face. It was just plastic. Doll. It was really creepy <laughs> if you just walked by and saw me doing it. So the very last thing I started paying attention to in terms of portraiture is where people's eyes are in direction to the brightest point to create like an actual catch light in their eyes and not have to like Photoshop it in or something like that. It's a big deal. Uh, the situation we just shot in because she was facing a super, super bright light source, the reflection of the sun on that window, beautiful catch light in her eye. Hopefully that comes through in the photo. I'll add it here if it does. Nice. So again, we're balancing even more the actual backlight of the insanely bright sun against it itself bouncing off of that building. The areas that I look for if I'm using a natural fill light, the areas that I trend toward rather, um, are places that have like a neutral gray, white bounce. If that was a green building, she would be tinted green right now. And that is a tough thing to edit your way out of. You could black and white anything, but uh, usually I prefer to start with color and I look for areas that fill things in with the complementary skin tone color. That makes sense. I'm gonna use the prism for this one. <laughs> I'm gonna kind of frame up an idea and then we'll just... Ooh, ooh, okay. No adjustment needed. So the cool thing about the prism is uh, you're shooting through a three-sided object. So you get the side you're shooting through doesn't do anything. So first effect, shooting through one side, the other two sides are being reflected without any real distortion at the same time. So it's very disorienting and abstract. And then the second look is actually shooting with the prism, pivoting, kind of rotating at an angle like this to create streaks and bends. It actually curves the that's being affected. The last step to think about shooting with a prism is uh, having a fair amount of dark darkness in the composition. So this is the darkest part that I see in this scene right now, this green pole. Can you step a little that way? That's good, yep. So generally what I do is kind of find where that darkest area is and then add the prism on top of it because it really pops. If you just have a really bright scene like the sky or a white wall or something, whatever, then you add the prism. Sometimes you'll get a cool effect, but usually it just becomes like a weird abstraction. Uh, when you've got it overlapping a really dark area, it just pops in a way that is much easier to start with. Ooh, ooh can you look down over your shoulder? Oh, that's yeah, it's kind of something like that. But it's a lot of balance. Like you're balancing this against an insanely heavy camera. This is seriously like all kinds of stuff. Yeah. It's so heavy. People get fixated on just the process of what's happening and they forget about 
the composition of what they're reflecting back into the shot. So yeah, that's tricky. I'm gonna do one more AI feed because I'm curious what it does when I say you use a prism. Zero percent, what do you think? 15%. I don't know if it's gonna understand the prism thing. I'm curious. It looks like maybe. Oh right, because you put prism. Yeah. Yes, you can generate an image in some third style. Yeah, I've tried that before. And it's uh, it seems to lean just like generic wedding pose. Yeah. Which I use all the time. I'm nothing I have nothing against generic uh, wedding poses, but I don't know if it's actually scraping the internet for my work. We did try a prompt earlier today with just her name, like Chloe's actual name. Yeah. And it did turn out a subject that looked similar-ish. Chloe-ish. Chloe-ish. <laughs> so we've got the results. So its interpretation of a prism is okay. kind of interesting. Like oh, that, which one looks the most like you? The top two? All right, I'm gonna do a full render of the upper right one. Interesting. Yeah, I think that's the little like streak is trying to be a prism. Oh wow! Right? Oh wow! <laughs> she just has more like squinty. <laughs> She's more horror like. For sure. Yeah, <laughs> the women in, from Mid Journey always have a sense of. Uh, what was that really scary movie? The Ring. Yeah. The like. Yeah. Okay, so let's get back into the sunlight. I'm gonna try one with just that slight streak of flare if I can make it. Usually the thing I fight against using the prism is uh, the fact that it really heavily affects, really heavily affects like one half or a quarter of the scene and leaves the rest, the rest totally untouched. So I kind of like the idea of maybe holding it further away from my camera and get something just up and down the middle where the sides are left untouched. We'll see. Let's try that as a player. Can you stand here facing me? So I'm just using the hey, Chloe. Uh, ooh, ooh, a little that way and then just Keep your body facing me, but kind of turn and look over that direction. Too much public transit. And there we are. It's kind of interesting. Huh. Ooh, ooh. And then I'm trending kind of using the prism in this area of the frame because it's darker. Like I mentioned earlier, when you can kind of pop the prism on top of a darker area, it really pops and makes more sense as an effect versus this direction. Although the flare is kind of cool. The only way to turn that horizontal flare into being vertical is to physically rotate the prism, which is another like really fun thing to do. Ooh, I love that. That's good. Yeah. There we are. Yeah, that's, that's the Boom. There it is. Oh, that was cool. Can't wait to edit that. Nice. <laughs> So yeah, it's an interesting thought experiment to see how the AI shoots me off in a different direction. I almost always shoot with the prism right up against the front of the lens. And so maybe actually shooting kind of further out where you can place it as an effect in the middle of the frame or wherever, maybe like this even, um, is interesting to think about. But 